Hello, welcome to Teach the Word. Thanks for joining today. Uh, the topic is the church. I'm going to talk about um, what it looks like, maybe its historical origin, a little bit of that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to um, learn about your church from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, just for a starting point, uh, a definition. What is a church? Or what is the church? And uh, <clears throat> we'll take our definition from Acts 2. Um, and that'll be that the church is a gathering of believers uh, who connect with God and with each other. So the purpose is a gathering of people for the purpose of connecting with each other and to connect with God. And we see that in Acts 2. If we go to the end of Acts 2, uh, look at Acts 2, 42 through 47, we'll see where this definition is taken from or how it's arrived at from this passage. So that's Acts 2, 42. So this is very much a descriptive definition. It's not so much theological as just a descriptor. Uh, a gathering where believers connect with God and with each other. Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them all, as any one had need. So continuing daily with one another in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, and bringing and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So that is uh, Paul's description, or not Paul, this is Luke, Luke's description of the first church. And as you can see in there, you have the elements of them connecting with each other, and they're eating together, and you have the elements of connecting with God. Prayer, preaching, teaching, it's all there. All right, so that's a definition. Um, we want to nuance that definition by looking that definition by looking at usage and really two primary meaning senses i'm sure there's others but definitely two that surface in the new testament and one is uh to refer to um, a specific gathering in a specific location with a specific people so for that why don't we just look at uh just go a little further in acts Let's look at acts 14. 21 through 23, where we have um, several churches mentioned. Acts 14, 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord, and they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So there you have uh, every church in the various cities which are named, what are named here, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So at least four churches, maybe there's more than one church per city, we're not really sure, but at least in every city there's elders appointed for the church. I would assume there's only one gathering in each city. So then, <clears throat> I don't know why I assume that. So you have a specific sense. Uh, where else would we find it? How about, uh, let's look at the end of Romans, where the greetings and salutations are at the end of the letter. So Romans 16, 1. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centria. So, not the church. The church is, is meaning here a specific location. Now, I want to contrast that with a different meaning sense of the same word in the New Testament, and that's where you have a reference to all believers everywhere. So let's jump forward to 1 Corinthians 15, 9. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. It doesn't just mean in one location. He was traveling around uh, the... Uh, ancient Near East, trying to kill, stamp out the church in different locations. Um, what else? How about Ephesians? Just flip forward to Ephesians 1. Let's see. Uh, 
Jesus' work uh, for the church in his death. Um, let's see here. I'm going to start in verse 20, maybe. Or about what we do, 19. According to the working of his, that's God's, mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. This is the church universal, collective, cr everywhere, that, which is the grand assembly of all the local assemblies, of which Christ is the head, uh, and of which, which Christ wrought a victory on the cross uh, to be head over all things to the church, or for the church. Yes, <clears throat> it's to the church in this translation. So, two different meaning senses. There's other, as you were to read the New Testament, you would find the, the local individual meaning sense and the broad collective meaning sense, multiple places, so they're both used a lot. And you might even find other meaning senses uh, where this word church is not even used to refer to an assembly of Jesus' followers, but is referring to other things altogether, just uh, some type of gathering. So the core meaning has to do with gathering together. Um, <clears throat> but we're talking specifically about the church is of God, the churches of Jesus Christ, where uh, <clears throat> which are met, which are we're defining from Acts two forty two to forty seven as a gathering where believers connect with God and with each other. So, I want to talk about what it looked like and uh, maybe some of its origin. So, for this, I want to go back and look at um, how the New Testament describes the Jewish synagogue. There's not a terrible amount of material on the Jewish synagogue in the New Testament, but the Jewish synagogue features prominently enough in the New Testament. And... Uh, I want to draw some parallels about how, <clears throat> in its origin, this is quite a logical thing. All of the early first believers were Jews who had participated in synagogue affairs. A synagogue is a gathering of believers, Jewish believers, uh, for a purpose of connecting with each other and connecting with God. And, and that's what they did in the synagogue. And uh, when they, these people who had all participated in synagogues started the move. Well, participated in the movement started by Jesus, and they gathered as the church. They were gathering to connect with each other and with God. It's not surprising that a lot of what they did, um, and, and even some of their structure, looked a lot like the, that looked like a Jewish synagogue's doings and structure. And I want to try to point that out by looking at some descriptive passages of the synagogues in the New Testament, and then also looking at some of the descriptive passages of the church. So, um, let's just talk uh, for for the for to begin with uh, about uh, power structures and organization. Um, so why don't we uh, go back into the Gospels? So let's flip back into the Gospels and we'll take a look. We can start in uh, Mark, Mark thirteen, thirteen nine. But watch out for yourselves, for they, this is Jesus talking to his followers about what will happen to them in the synagogues, because the synagogue system is not going to like Jesus' followers. And he's telling them, watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to many. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So, what's going to happen to the followers of Jesus? Well, they're going to be delivered up to councils. They'll be beaten in the synagogues. So, beating is a punishment, and it's a punishment <clears throat> that's delivered after uh, convictions are handed down when a council convenes and tries people for various uh, crimes, right? Religiously related crimes. That's the kind of thing that can happen in a synagogue. Um, and as you read through the New Testament, you'll find it's the kind of thing that can happen in the New Testament church as well. Uh, it's a practice called church discipline, which 
Jesus talks about, Paul talks about, Apostle John talks about. But at any rate, so that's some of the uh, power structure glimpse at it, uh, the disciplinary action side of things. Let's look at Luke 4, because uh, this is a synagogue scene, a very long and extended synagogue scene, where Jesus is in the synagogue, kind of inaugurating his ministry. But you'll see a few characters here that resemble what happens in the church. So, 16. So he came to Nazareth, and when he had, where he had been brought up, this is, he is Jesus. So Luke 4, 16. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he, chose, he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you do in Capernaum, do also here in this country, in your country. And he said, Surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you the truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout the land. But none of them was Elijah sent to except Zarephath in the region of Sidon to the woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill over which the city was built, that he might throw him down over the cliff. So you get a glimpse of how the uh, synagogue system reacted to Jesus' ministry, uh, which is very similar to how they reacted to the ministry of his followers. Uh, anti is uh, the best way to describe that. That's Jesus' sermon, but what I wanted to point out here is there's two things. The public reading of scripture. That's what happened in the synagogue, and we get indications that that's what also happens in the New Testament church. Um, public reading of scripture, then preaching that expounds upon it. That's what Jesus does. And I also want to point out the uh, a position here. They, they call Luke uh, calls him the attendant, the si attendant of the synagogue. So where was that? Verse twenty. He closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. So here's a position of some sort where uh, the guy's taking care of some kind of service position where he's taking care of the Torah scrolls and the, the scrolls of the prophet Isaiah, other scrolls, all the scrolls. But it's a service position within the synagogue. And we find it in similar in the structure of the early church, service positions. And they're, they're referred to by the New Testament <coughs> transliterated Greek word deacon, dikanos, translated, transliterated into English as deacon, but it just means servant. Um, but they're doing service in the church, much like this attendant is doing service in the synagogue gathering. All right, so that's Luke 4. If we jump through a few more passages in Luke, we'll see um, another uh, title that Luke uses, which is ruler of the synagogue, or rulers of the synagogue. So if you look at, let's go to 8, uh, 14.1 is another synagogue scene, right? So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, oh wait, this is the wrong, pa this is not the ruler passage. I'm sorry, I, I want to read 7. 7. I'll read that passage in a second, but I want to read first 7, 3, Luke 7, 3. So this is uh, am I just confused? No, I'm reading the right passage. This is what I want to read. Okay, so I'm in 840. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting him. And behold, 
there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter who was 12 years of age, and she was dying. But he went, but as he went, the multitudes thronged him. So here we have a man who's referred to as a ruler of the synagogue, and his name is Jairus, and he is seeking Jesus' help. Um, and then we'll just to flesh out this term, ruler of the synagogue, let's jump forward in Luke before we go back to 7.3, which is, uh, we'll go to Luke 13, where we get another synagogue scene in Luke. This is Luke 13, um, what, 14? Is that where I want to be? Yes. Now, let's start in verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could no, in no ways rise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to himself, to him, and he said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because the Jews, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them. And, do, and not on the Sabbath. Then the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite, do, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water? So ought this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? When he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. So here we have a, an individual who's the ruler of the synagogue who's in a position of authority to tell the people in the synagogue how to behave, what to do. So he's, and the, the technical term Luke's using to refer to this guy is ruler of the synagogue. Um, if we were to trace Luke's language forward, uh, we have uh, several instances in Acts, where Paul on his ministry in the diaspora cities, the Greek cities, is going to and from, in and out of synagogues. You need help? You need help? Like Daddy can help you. Yeah, don't worry. Don't panic. Okay, yeah. Take off your cardigan. Okay. Sorry about that. So, uh, let's just look at some of those passages. So, we'll go to Acts. Where are we now? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Is it Acts 9? No, Acts, Acts 9 is Saul, right? Um, so, we don't... What's it? Acts 11 what happens here. Um, no, that's, that's the church. That's describing the church. So, in Paul's missionary journey, I think, is where we want to be. So, let's go to Acts uh, 13. Yeah. Acts 13. Starting in verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. This is Paul and, and is it Barnabas? Yeah, Paul and Barnabas. I guess Saul and Barnabas. When they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and they went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if, any, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. At any rate, Paul stands up and he starts preaching, and the, the sermon goes on for uh, the entire chapter, and then you get way down at the end of this chapter 13, you get uh, the sermon concludes in verse 41, and uh, you get the aftermath, verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words should be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews that, and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, permitted them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. So, it goes on to commentate on that. But three things to point out from this synagogue scene in Acts 13. One is that we have the reading of what? The Law and the Prophets, just like we saw the prophets. We saw Jesus was the one who did the reading of the, of the prophets in Luke 4. The Law and the Prophets are read. That happens every time the synagogue convenes. We have a sermon, a word of exhortation, preaching on the Law and the Prophets, given by Paul, actually, as a guest. Um, and we have these this group of people known as the elders of the synagogue who have the authority to 
preside over the affairs that are going on in the synagogue service and ask Luke and or Paul or Saul and Barnabas to speak or not to speak, you get it, the rulers. And then we have the exclusion of the Gentiles. They're not really welcome. They're not happy about a bunch of Gentiles showing up. That's a feature of the synagogue that is dissimilar to the church. Uh, but at least point that out. Um, all right, that's enough synagogue scenes. Just want to go back to work, that one passage in Luke 7, 7, 3, where uh, there's another term used, in, and it's kind of connected with synagogues, and that's the term elder. It's not clear that the elders are elders in the synagogue, but at least they're the elders of the city where the synagogue is. This is Capernaum, right? So 7-1, ent Jesus enters Capernaum. And then if you go down to 7-3, or 7-2, uh, a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. Said so verse 3, so when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And they came to Jesus. When they had come to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying, that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. And this is what they say about this, this centurion. Verse 5. For he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. So you you get the term, you get the idea that and Jesus heals this man's son. Just Jesus is about healing. You get the idea that uh, the elders, the Jewish elders of Capernaum, may also be um, involved in ruling and governing the synagogue because. They mentioned the synagogue, but it, may, it may, may, may not be the case. It may be that the elders of the city of Capernaum are to be differentiated from the rulers of the synagogue. They may not be uh, the same group, or it may be that the groups just overlap in such a way that that uh, maybe it's not, not a smart thing to talk about distinguishing between them. But um, <clears throat> at any rate, let's talk about the structures in the early church. So in the early church, you have, much like you saw the attendant taking care of the Torah scrolls, you have people in service positions. Let's look at Acts 6. What's going on there? Now in those days, Acts 6 verse 1, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitudes of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timonus, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. So the, the noun form uh, deacon is servant is not used here, but the uh, verb form to serve is used here uh, in verse 3, is it? No, verse 2, and serve the tables. So there's a ministry of administering to the widows, which presumably means you're either sitting or standing behind a table and you're attending to what's going on, so serving the tables. And uh, the church ordains people for those functions, much like the synagogue had a service position of the the Torah scroll attendant, who may have been ordained for that position, we don't know. Let's just look to further this uh, servant business. Let's look at uh, 1 Timothy. Timothy, Timothy, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus are the pastoral epistles. They're instructions given by the Apostle Paul to uh, four pastors, those who are leaders in the church. Um, and you'll see uh, a real uh, clear... Uh, talking about uh, this idea of deacon. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be, or servants, must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Let those who first, let those also first be tested, let them, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. But those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Jesus Christ. It's a position within the church to serve, a service position. Uh, that's a parallel I'm trying to draw between the attendant mentioned in Luke, the Torah scroll attendant, 
and the deacons in serving tables in Acts 6, or the deacons who Paul talks about how to choose deacons. Then I want to talk about the uh, this other role, which is the rulers of the synagogue, which Paul's mentioning, or not Paul, Luke is mentioning in Luke and in Acts. And it may be that that's a similar group to the elders of the city, like the elders of Capernaum, who are talking about the synagogue in Luke 7. Maybe, maybe it's a different group. But what's the uh, parallel in the New Testament for the church is uh, elders of the church. It doesn't, they don't, Luke doesn't use the term rulers of the church. He uses the term elders of the church. And they very much seem to be doing the same kind of things that the elders of the synagogue, or the rulers of the synagogue were doing. Um, so where would we find a description of, of that? Well, let's just look at Acts, where uh, we read the very first verse we read, was it? Today, Acts 13, where we were talking about the church individual rather than, than collective. Maybe it wasn't the first verse, because I think the first one we read was Acts 2, right? But if we look at Acts, was it Acts? Was it, it must have been Acts 14 we read, right? Yeah where they were appointing elders. Yeah, Acts 14, 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commanded them, commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So there, it's, a, it's a position to govern the affairs of the church. That doesn't give much description about what the elders do, but if we look at Acts 20, we get um, quite extensive description. So it's a, it's a long passage, but let's read it because we're talking about how the church of God is organized. So... Let's look at this, this position, which is interchangeably referred to by Paul or Peter, uh, other New Testament writers. Luke, actually, is the one who's writing here, but Paul writes elsewhere. Peter writes about it. Three terms are used in an in a interchangeable type sense, and that is elder, overseer, and, and pastor, or sh shepherd is, is another way to, tra to say it's pastor, but elder, overseer, and pastor. So let's look at 17. From Miletus, so I'm in Acts 20, he, that's Paul, sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but claimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I am bound to go in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things which will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish the ra my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves will men rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone, night and day, with tears, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know how these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown, so, sown, shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down, and prayed with them all. Then they were, and then they all wept freely, and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke. And they would see his face, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to his ship. So there is Paul's a just very active description of the job of the elder, overseer, pastor, which is, seems to be an interchangeable term. In verse seventeen, they're just calling them elders. In verse. Uh, uh, 28, he's calling them overseers who are shepherding. He doesn't use the noun shepherd, but the verb. Uh, what's the job is to, to protect the flock, guide it, lead it. 
very similar to what the rulers of the synagogue are doing. They're trying to protect the synagogue from threats from the outside or from within, and they perceive Jesus as a threat, uh, wrongly, but that's how they perceive him. They're trying to do, do the job of protecting, just like the elders that Paul uh, ordained in the cities where he established churches. Um, there's other New Testament passages about elders. Maybe we should just look at a few of them. Uh, so that was Luke recounting Paul's sermon. Why don't we just look at Paul's own writings about uh, on the subject of elder. We can go to, why don't we go to Titus. We were just in Timothy 3, but that also talks about elders, but Titus is a new place. Uh, let me look at first uh, t one Titus chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop, here they use the, the English translation bishop, is the, sac, uh, the exact same underlying Greek is translated overseer in what we just read in was it Acts 20? Acts 20, 28 says overseer. They translated overseer. Well, this this Bible, this New King James, translates the exact same word in <clears throat> Titus 1, 6 as, or 1, 7 as bishop. For a bishop must be blameless as a servant of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. What's the underlying Greek? It's it's a uh, episkopos or something. I don't know Greek that would be great, but the root word there is epis, episkopos or uh, which is uh, where the English church structure Episcopalian comes from, that Greek word. The uh, underlying Greek word for elder is uh, presbyteros, which is where the, if you're interested in linguistics, where Presbyterian comes from. So it comes from the Greek translation. The underlying Greek for elder is Presbyterian. The underlying Greek for overseer or bishop is Episcop Episcopalian. Uh, presbyteros, episkopos. So, but you see again in this Titus passage, this is Paul speaking, he uses interchangeably elder, presbyteros, in verse 5 of Titus 1, and uh, bishop slash overseer or episcopos in verse 7, same chapter. So what what is the whole idea? Did I read the, uh, did, I, did I get hung up on talking about bishops or did I finish reading this? It's slipping my mind, but let's just, let's just read what their job is in verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as it has been taught, that he may be able by sound may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. That's the job of the overseer, which is which I I'm trying to make a case is parallel to the job of the ruler of the synagogue. Um, how about Peter? So that's Paul's own words. Peter talking about uh, this very thing. Let's go to First Peter five. Uh, I think Peter's using shepherd in his, or at least, at least the shepherding analogy. First uh, Peter five verse one: The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd, so it's it's a uh, verb form. But you see in verse 1 he has elders, and in verse 2 he has their job shepherding or pastoring. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. And also, So he's got all three terms. Uh, pastor, shepherd, and elder. In verses 1 and 2. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, which is Jesus Christ, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Um, so really, I think the only time we get shepherd as a noun in the New Testament, it's referring to Jesus as the chief shepherd. And then these overseers and deacons are like under shepherds. Um, you may be wondering why I'm switching back and forth between the term shepherd and pastor, and you may think those are not the same thing. Uh, it's because <clears throat> they are the same thing, except pastor is, an, is a term in English that has 
stopped being used to refer to grass and sheep and 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 caring for, for sheep. Exclusively we use the term shepherd and shepherding for that now. Pastor, pastoring used to be used in a, the bygone eras of English for that very thing. And in the church, when we were by analogy talking about dealing with sheep as part of the job of, of the overseers of the church, the church is the flock of Christ, Christ is a shepherd, the overseers and the elders are like our under shepherds. The older terminology of pastor, pastoring, got applied exclusively to the church. And as we move forward and language changes over time, you know, we come into the 21st century and uh, pastor, pastoring is almost exclusively used within the church. You're only going to find it referring to grass and, and, and animal, fuzzy, fuzzy furry animals in archaic English literature, not in modern usage. But it's just how language has changed. So one, one, they're synonyms. Shepherd, shepherd and pastor are, are synonyms. They mean the same thing. Uh, shepherding, pastoring, synonymous. But uh, in, in usage, one's used exclusively in the church today. One's used exclusively of farming, agriculture, or not agriculture, uh, livestock. Uh, anyways, so enough said there. That's that's uh, to point out similarities in the power structures. So the, uh, you have elders, rulers of the synagogues, you have uh, attendants in the synagogues, well in the church you have elders, overseers, pastors, same kind of thing, and you have deacons. So parallel uh, power structures or offices. Um, so that's, that's one point of similarity. Now let's just talk briefly about organization. What I mean by organization is I mean that the synagogues had a Jerusalem epicenter, and uh, Jerusalem was the, the high uh, authority, uh, and we can see that um, in the account of Act uh, of in Acts, in the of the account the account is of Luke, not Luke, Paul going from Jerusalem to synagogues in Damascus, but Jerusalem seems to be the governing place because in Jerusalem is the the seat of Jewish government. It's where the Sanhedrin, which is the great the large council, sits and and rules the Jewish nation, um, and the synagogues in some sense recognize that as an authority. So what happens here in uh, Acts 9? We'll start reading in verse 1. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and something changes. It's a dramatic story in Acts 9. Uh, God intervenes in a powerful way, and he opens Saul's eyes to the uh, to what he's doing. That what he's doing is not a good thing. Um, but we'll start. I just want to point out the organizational structure. You have a Jerusalem Council, Sanhedrin, and you have uh, it having uh, intercourse or inter interconnectedness with the synagogues and the diaspora. And you see that here that Paul can take Saul can take letters from the, uh, the Jerusalem epicenter to synagogues in the diaspora city, and they have authoritative weight there. Right? Same thing. I want to point out the authoritative weight of the Jerusalem epicenter of the early church, the church assembly. So there's there's churches in on all the diaspora cities, just like there's synagogues. Well, there's more synagogues because the Jews are, or at least early on, the Jewish people have a wider dispersion than the, the spread of Christianity, right? But many cities have churches in them, which are meeting places of, of uh, believers. And they, in the same way, parallel to the synagogues, viewed the, the Jerusalem center as, a, as an authoritative epicenter. They're connected to it. They're interconnected and connected to the Jerusalem center. It's the same thing with the churches. And we see that in Acts. So um, all that to say, let's go to Acts uh, 13. Um, is it 13 that I want to be? No, it's 14, right? Yeah, 14. Well, no, actually it's 15, the Jerusalem Council. And when, and when certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
Therefore, when Paul, I'm in verse 2 of Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension to dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to the brethren. So what happens is uh, a council is convened. It, in many ways, it, it parallels the Jewish ruling governing body, which is a council of 70 elders. Uh, but this is within the, that's within the Jewish governmental system. This is within the church. Now the verse six. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. What's the matter? Whether or not you have to become circumcised and convert to Judaism if you're a Gentile in order to receive Christ. You see some of the sect of the Pharisees. You see that in verse five. Um, who believe rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. And that's the question. Paul's at, at odds with members of this sect of the Pharisees. Paul also is a member of the sect of the Pharisees, but he's at odds with these members of the sect of the Pharisees. So the apostles and elders, they, verse 7, and there had been much dispute. So there's a lot of, it's an intensely debated question, right? And it, it records the dialogue um, and then you, you get the result in verse 22 of Acts 15. And it pleased the apostles and the elders when the whole church, with the whole church, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was named Barsabas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. So then there's a very short decision of this council that's recorded in writing. And uh, we see that Paul and Barnabas uh, go out and they, uh, where is it? Here it is. Verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, wait, no, that's their conversation. Then they actually go, it's in 16 where they go out. The end of 15 is them talking about their trip. Uh, then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, all right. So he encounters uh, Timothy. So that's the beginning of the story. And let's just just read just verse uh, sixteen four. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees. That's the decree of the Jerusalem Council to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. I want to point out that's a pretty strong parallel between with the church having a Jerusalem epicenter being binding on the diaspora congregations and there being an interconnectedness between them, just like Jerusalem has has the, the Grand Council, the Sanhedrin, and it has a binding authority on synagogues around the diaspora as evidenced by the letters being sent from both, right? The, Jer the Jerusalem church can send out letters that can be delivered and have binding weight. And just like the, uh, the high priests can send out letters through Saul. But <laughs> interestingly enough, in, in the Acts narrative, Saul is the bearer of both letters. He's taking letters from the Sanhedrin in Acts 9, and he's taking letters from the, uh, the Jerusalem church in Acts, the apostles in Acts 16, and delivering them. Um, so, similarities, right? We got uh, power, structure, how it's governed, the offices, similarities. You've got organizational similarities with the interconnectedness, the Jerusalem epicenter. Um, what else? Uh, there are other similarities. How about the, uh, the purpose in meeting and what they do when they meet? Um, we saw quite a bit of that in uh, Luke 4 and was it Acts 14 where um, scripture is read right, in the synagogue, and then preaching is done. They read scripture, they preach. Um, we we uh, also see um, a very similar thing in the, uh, the New Testament uh, church. Um, <clears throat> so let's just try to look at a few references that would highlight that um, about the church. But uh, let's look at We'll start with preaching, uh, reading the word and preaching and teaching. Let's look at Timothy. Um, so that would be what Timothy 
is it chapter 4, 1 Timothy 4, 13? Is that where I want to be? Let's go to Timothy. <laughs> Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Um, this translation just says reading. You'll notice if you were to read this verse, 1 Timothy 4, 13, and uh, some other translations, you might see, uh, uh, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. Uh, and the reason for that is the Greek word that's used here for reading is not uh, a normal word that's used, uh, you know, just to mean to read something. It's used specifically of reading in the, uh, the context of the, um, the synagogue. Uh, if you go, if we go to, um, second Corinthians, uh, is it, uh, four? Yeah. Second, no, I think it's three. Second Corinthians three, where he's talking about, um, what goes on in the synagogue. This is Paul. Um, where was that? Uh, Verse 15, I think, could be, well, let's just, let's just start maybe 12. So 2 Corinthians 3, let's start in verse 12. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies in their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So the words being used here for reading, when Moses is read, is what Paul is talking about in verse chapter 3 here of Second Corinthians. That's Moses being read in the synagogue. Um, that reading is what's, what... Paul is talking about when, when, to Timothy when he says, give attention to reading. He's not, what he's not saying to Timothy is, you know, go read widely. Go to the library, get some books out. It's read scripture out loud in the church. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands. Um, if we were to uh, <clears throat> go to 2 Timothy, we'll see the chart. So this is reading, right? How about, we saw reading and preaching in our examples of when we did a tour of the Jewish synagogue. Well, go to 2 Timothy 4. What do we have? I charge you, verse 1, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word, be in season, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will keep up for themselves teachers. Um, I could have gone, I could go through the gospels and point out lots of examples where teaching is happening in the synagogues. Uh, we, we gave a few examples, but there's many more where Jesus, Jesus is doing stuff in the synagogues. He's teaching. He's, he's doing miracles. The, the word is being read. Preaching is happening. And that's the same, that's the same thing that the church is doing when they convene. What happens in the synagogue? Reading of scripture. Preaching and teaching, expounding upon it. We see that as the command to the leaders of the church in the pastoral epistles, and we see that descriptively as what's happening in the synagogue. Very similar in what uh, in practice when they get together. Another similarity I want to point out is eating. Uh, what does the church do every time they get together? We saw in Acts 2.42, they're breaking bread from house to house. Well, let's just go to First uh, Corinthians and just look at uh, like chapter 10. 11, 10, 16, 17-ish, um, 10, 16, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Or jump forward another chapter to uh, chapter 11, um, verse 20. Therefore, when you come together, in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? 
Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not praise you. Uh, so you get the, the, the picture that they're eating together in, in their church meetings. Well, that's not all that different from a synagogue. What happens in a synagogue? Well, in a synagogue, <clears throat> on Shabbat morning, you go to synagogue, you read the Torah, the Torah is preached on, and you're there for a while, and <clears throat> everybody's hungry by the time the synagogue service is over. So what do you think happens? Fellowshipping with food. Uh, we see this actually in the Gospels uh, when Jesus, it's, it's in Mark, where they, they leave, hey, can you, can you stop making noise? They, they leave the, uh, the synagogue, I have to find that, I think it's in chapter one of Mark, yeah, chapter one. So, Verse 21, now, then they went to, into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. That's what Jesus does in the synagogue. Teaching happens in the synagogue. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught as one having authority. Um, then he cast out a demon in the course of events, uh, and everybody's amazed. And then what happens? Verse 29. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon, Andrew, and James, and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever. They, lay, they told him about her at once. So he came, he took her by the hand, and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. So they go into the house, because they're hungry, and they eat. But in the, in the process of time, somebody's sick, Jesus heals her, and she serves them food. The same thing happens in synagogues today. I mean, uh, the last time I was in a synagogue was in Jerusalem. And uh, what did we do after we were there for, for what was a very long time? Because <clears throat> when everything's in a different language it's, and you can't really follow it very well, it seems like it's a lot longer than normal. So they read the Torah. They talked about it. A lot of stuff happened in it. We all funneled out of the, the main room. We went into a uh, building next door and we ate. That's what that's what they did in this. That was part of synagogue functions in the first century. It is still today. It was part of church functions in the first century. And surprise, surprise, it's still part of church functions today. Many churches have meals together after services. Um, so similarities. We looked at similarities between the synagogue and the church. We looked at uh, offices like role or power structures. Uh, we looked at organizational aspects, Jerusalem epicenter, stuff like that. We looked at the um, preaching, teaching, and reading of the Word of God, uh, very similarity. And we looked at the um, eating, the breaking of bread, and fellowship, connecting with people, connecting with God. Uh, I also want to point out differences. Maybe we can end with the differences, uh, and that will be enough for this video. What are the differences? Well, there's significant differences. We already hinted at one. And that's the that's the issue of the Gentiles. Remember in Acts was in Acts 14 where they're not very happy that the whole city has come together and there's a bunch of Gentiles in the synagogue and they start to uh, contradict. Um, it's 13, right? Acts 13. They start to contradict um, Paul's message because they don't want Gentiles. That's a difference in the church. The church is. Um, very much so uh, a zeroing place. It's a place where uh, inequality differences are zeroed out. And that wasn't the case with the synagogue. The synagogue was, a, was a, held up a differentiation between Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the church very clearly didn't do that. We saw that as the decree of the Jerusalem Council. Gentiles were allowed in without becoming non-Gentile, right? They're allowed to maintain their Gentile identity and be admitted. Uh, we also see the church being a place of leveling for uh, economic disparity. So let's look at uh, James chapter 2. You see in James 2, get to James. I'm having trouble finding James. 
My brethren, verse 1, James 2. Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine apparel, you say to him, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there, or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? That's not okay, but it was happening in some of these churches, and the, the uh, leaders are condemning it. Uh, we also have uh, economic, or not, that's economic. We also have gender, uh, you know, equality, in a sense, in the church. Uh, if you look at uh, Galatians, is it, is it Galatians? Uh, I believe I want to be is in Galatians 3. Let's see, Galatians 3, 5. Is that it? No. Where where is, is it three twenty eight? So that's it. Three twenty eight. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. You see, the gender, slave Jew nor Greek is racial. Uh Slave or free is economic, social, and male or female is gender. There's no um, bigotry. There's no gender chauvinism. There's no racial bigotry. There's no um, social economic prejudice. It all has no place in the church of God. That was not the case with the synagogue, as we saw in the, uh, the Acts 13 account, where there is racial bigotry, racial prejudice. They're not happy when Gentiles are admitted. Um, what else? Uh, that's one difference. Uh, another difference is the synagogue was kind of a status quo part of the world. Um, wasn't a threat. The church was viewed differently. It was viewed as a threat to the current order of things. Um, if you look at... Uh, Acts 17, in, in, when the church comes to Thessalonica, you see that the Thessalonians are intimidated by it. And they make this statement in verse 6. They say, Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. That's, that's the church is viewed as in, inaugurating social upheaval, up, up, upseating, upturning the current status quo of the social order. That really wasn't the case with the Jewish synagogue, it was considered part of the status quo. Um, what else? Uh, how about signs and wonders? That's something that was happening through the ministry of Jesus in the synagogues, perhaps through the ministry of Paul in the synagogues, but more so uh, outside of the synagogues in the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ was characterized by signs and wonders and power. Um, the Jewish synagogue system wasn't. Um, in fact, Jesus, in part, was expelled from the synagogues uh, and Christianity expelled from the synagogue system because they were happy about the displays of supernatural power. They didn't want people being healed in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And they told Jesus to stop healing people. And Jesus said, no, you're, you, you're a hypocrite. Uh, but... The church had no problem with the healing going on. And let's just read, you know, one particularly dramatic example from Acts 19 about uh, Paul and uh, <clears throat> the healings, curious healings, 1911. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. And the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. And some of the... Here's, here's the contrast. That's Paul. Powerful miracles being performed through him, through the church. Now, what, what's the parallel? What do we see within the synagogue? Now, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, verse 13, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, who did so. 
And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom this evil spirit was leaped on them and overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to all the Jews in Greece, dwelling in Ephesus, and the fear and fear fell on all them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So what do you see? We see a difference between the church in Ephesus and the synagogue in Ephesus. Power, signs and wonders are characteristic of the church, but not of the, uh, the synagogue. So there's a few differences. Uh, name, let's just review. So we're, we're wrap up this video. Uh, the church is defined as a gathering. We're defining it descriptively, not, not so much theologically, but descriptively as a gathering where people come to connect with each other and meet God. Um, that's what they're doing. And uh, has two meaning senses, a local, specific location, specific gathering, or all believers everywhere. Uh, those are the two meaning senses, at least two meaning senses, frequently used in the New Testament. And then in origin, seems to have come out, I would argue, it comes out of the Jewish synagogue. It's, it's very much the same type of thing. It's a gathering of Jews. I mean, all the early believers were Jews who had met in synagogues. And they started a different way of meeting. It bears a lot of similarities. We looked at four similarities. Uh, positions of, of power structure, you know, how it's organized power-wise, how it's organized interconnectedly between the different churches and the Jerusalem at the center, very similar to the synagogue. Um, we looked at the uh, similarities in what they're doing when they gather together, the preaching of the word, the reading of scripture, teaching, and uh, eating, eating food. Um, so those are four similarities we looked at. And we looked at three notable differences. Uh, the inclusion of, of the Gentiles was not hallmark of the synagogue. There was there was some racial prejudice lines. There was there was dividing walls of, of race. Um, but not just inclusion of the Gentiles, but uh, breaking down all kinds of chauvinism and uh, barriers, whether they be uh, gender or social economic. The church was 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 it attempting to break those all down, just like the racial barriers. Um, so that was a notable difference. Another notable difference is the church was a threat to the established social order. The synagogue system was actually part of the established social order. And then a, a third difference, which is very similar to the threat, is the power that accompanied the church, the signs and the wonders that were not accompanying the uh, synagogue. So there's a little bit about the church. Let's just call it the church uh, part one. Uh, thank you for joining. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord God, that your churches would um, be faithful to our calling, to, um, to be part of the DNA that you wrote into the church in the New Testament, that that would be characteristic of your churches today, your gatherings, that we would be uh, gatherings where people meet you and connect with each other. There would be places where people are uh, find uh, your word read, uh, your word preached. There would be places where people are taught your truth. Uh, that there would be places where people um, find healing, uh, you know, emotional, physical, mental, all kinds of healing, Lord, from uh, the wounds of this world. Where there would be places that are zeroing grounds, where there is not racial prejudice, there is not uh, chauvinism, uh, you know, there is not uh, social economic bigotry. Lord, we pray that your church would be the way it is described and portrayed, um, the, the DNA that you, you breathe into it. We pray, Lord God, that your church would be a threat to the social order, a threat to the economic, or not the economic, but the, uh, the uh, status quo. We would be a threat to uh, the, the world system. It would bring change, forceful change, like your New Testament church did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining.